Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm not lonely today. Usually on Sabbaths, I'm lonely. For many years, I've been a pastor. And every Sabbath, I have a church family, and I'm with them. And now, I'm a ministerial director, and I'm at a different church every Sabbath. And so Sabbaths for me are lonely. But this morning, I'm at the Puyallup Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I came here as a pastor 28 years ago when Sarah was still in grade school. And uh, Ernie was still taking the, the little church up there. And there's so many people that are still here that I'm not lonely today because I always feel loved whenever I come here so it's a real privilege to be here with you and to be able to worship uh, Jesus I'm really pleased that you're starting small groups or you're working on small groups imagine yourself if you were an angel flying over the community what would you see? Would you see people doing meth below you? Would you see children being hurt and abused? Would you see crime and darkness and pain? But if there were Christians doing small groups, opening their Bibles, and praying to heaven, and light from heaven coming down among them, what would that be like for an angel? Do you think the angels are aware when there are people together worshiping him and, and praying together and praying for lost people and reading God's word and, and, and learning to love each other and connect in community? Do you think the angels are aware of that? Do you think they'll stand out as just points of light amidst the darkness? So what you're doing with small groups is really important. And I'm going to tell you right away, the devil is going to make it hard. You're going to be busy. You're going to be too tired. But keep going. Because every time you're tired and think, I'll take it off, and you choose to go, when you leave, you'll be glad you went. Would you pray with me one more time? Father in heaven, I praise Jesus for the good news of the gospel. I praise Jesus for hope. I praise you for what you've done in my broken life. And I ask for the privilege today of lifting up Jesus. And I ask for you to hide me behind his cross. Amen. I heard there was a child here who's four years old. Where's my four-year-old? Where's he at? Where's the little boy who said he was four? Would you come up here? Would you come up and help me with something? Isn't he a brave boy? Come on up here, buddy. I need your help. It's right here. Four years old. What's your name? Ethan. Ethan. Isn't Ethan a brave boy? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to tell a story about a four-year-old, but I wanted you to get a frame of reference of what size a four-year-old is. Ethan, you can go sit down. Thank you for helping me. That was very important. <laughs> Little Stephanie was four years old. She lived in Korea. Her mother was a Korean woman. Her father was an American soldier who had fought in the Korean War. They had had a relationship. I don't know if it was a very short relationship or if they had dated for a while. The end result was that the Korean woman was pregnant and gave birth to a child who was half American, half Korean. The American soldier may never know, have known 
that he had a child. He went back to America. And the Korean lady lived with her mother and father, raising this child, half Korean and half American. The culture did not have a way of accepting these children. So when little Stephanie's mother received a marriage proposal, the man said to her, I want to marry you and I want us to have a life together. And I want us to have a family. But you've got to do something else with that little mixed race girl. And so one morning, Stephanie's mother got her dressed, gave her a little bag of food, took her down to the bus, to the train station, and put her on a train. And she said, at a certain stop, an uncle will come and get you. So little Stephanie, four, year old, four years old, got on the train. And she rode hour after hour. She ate a little bit of food from her bag. She got off the train. And there was no uncle. She waited all day in the train station. No uncle came. The station manager made her leave the train station. So that little four-year-old girl, the bag of food was empty now. She walked down the street wondering where she was going to stay. She found a wagon parked by the side of the road. She crawled underneath it so at least she had something over her head. And she slept on the ground underneath a wagon all night. The next morning... Her stomach was hungry. There was no food. She went back to the train station and waited for an uncle who never came. She was abandoned. A homeless child living on the streets. There were other homeless children. Some of them, like her, of mixed race. They called them tukis, which meant garbage. We look at that story, and it bothers us. I think of when my child children were four years old, and I praise God for the security and protection they had around them. But little Stephanie's story is not something that happens rarely. It happens a lot. And that kind of racism is painful to think about. But let me ask you something. In our country, do we have racism? Do we mistreat people or reject them based on race? I want to say to the people of color here today, I'm sorry for the times where you have been treated without the dignity and without the respect that someone made in God's image deserves to be treated. I'm sorry. And I want to do everything I can to make sure in my little corner of the world and in my sphere of influence that no matter the race or background, that everyone is treated as someone made in God's image. And I believe the issue of problems with race is holding us back as God's people. Because if the world looks at us and sees us having racial tensions... We have a message for the world at the end of time. And the world is polarized on racial issues. So if they see us polarized along racial issues as well, it undercuts the credibility we have to share the end time message of hope with the world. 
Are you okay with me being honest? Amen. Yes. And so I really believe this issue is something we need to pray about and we need to do what we can to heal. And I think it starts with listening to other people. Uh, to be honest with you, until three years ago, I did not even know there was such a thing as white privilege. I didn't know. I was raised poor. I didn't feel privileged. And it wasn't until I started talking to people of different races and hearing what it was like for them growing up in America that I understood what this is. And I want to keep growing and understanding. There are books you can read and there are things you can do to understand. I think that God wants us this issue to be healed. So that, because didn't Jesus say they'll know you're my disciples if you love each other? Yeah. Little Stephanie was homeless. She had to find a place to sleep. She found a hole in the ground that an animal used to live in. She found some straw. She took it down to try to line this hole in the ground. And that's where she lived. She learned from the other children how to, to creep on her belly out into the farmer's fields and steal fruits and vegetables to stay alive. Uh, on the coldest, Korea has cold winters and on the coldest days, farmer's wives would allow her to sleep the night by the stove in their home and then they would make her leave in the morning. The farmers did not like her stealing fruits and vegetables, and one day a farmer caught her in his field. This little girl, he grabbed her, roughly, and he carried her over to the well, and he dropped her in. She fell a long way, and then she hit the water. Thankfully, there was a rock that protruded from the side of the well, so she could stand on that rock. And she looked up, and there was the circle of light. And there was no way in the world that little girl was going to be able to climb up and get out. And she just screamed and cried out and pleaded for help. And finally, an old woman from the village came and lowered the bucket down and told little Stephanie, get into the bucket. And the old woman turned the crank and, and brought little Stephanie up and out of the well. And as the old woman lifted her out of the bucket... She looked in her eyes and said, you must stay alive. I'm going to fast forward. Because there are parts of this story that are very painful. Little Stephanie lived for two years in a hole in the ground stealing fruits and vegetables to stay alive. And one day, a Swedish nurse was walking through the village and she passed by little Stephanie who was unconscious, lying on a pile of garbage. It was a Swedish nurse and she worked for an organization called World Vision, which is based in Federal Way. I have a huge respect for World Vision. Their motto is, let my heart be broken by the things that break God's heart. I ask you, are there things in Puyallup that break God's heart? The, the Northwest experiences a lot of human trafficking. We have the, the um, shipping that goes through here. There, is a, there are an alarming amount of women and children who are trafficked either for slave labor or for sexual exploitation. How does God's heart feel about that? Let my heart be broken by the things that break God's heart. For a pastor's meeting about a year and a half ago, I invited a young woman who lives in Seattle and her life work her career is it with an organization that battles human trafficking. And she came and talked to the pastors about human trafficking and what local churches can do to be part of the solution to stopping this horrible problem. 
There is a video made where some of these women who are horribly treated and sexually exploited and trafficked, where they have no one to turn to, no hope, no answers, and they will cry out to Jesus, and we are, they are experiencing where Jesus comes to them. Amen. This light figure comes to them. God's heart cares about the pain. And this world is getting darker and darker. And God's people's hearts need to become softer and softer so we care. The nurse was walking by. She saw little Stephanie unconscious lying on the pile of garbage. And she started to walk past. This nurse was from Sweden working for World Vision. And the reason why she was going to walk past is that her mandate, her job, was to find abandoned infants. And this was a six-year-old girl. So she was about to walk past. And she heard a voice. Did you know God speaks Swedish? And the voice said, She's mine. If God knows the number of the hairs of your head... Some of you have a lot. Some of us men have less. If God collects your tears in a bottle when your heart is broken, does he know every child that is hurt or abandoned or neglected or abused? And he said, she's mine. The nurse picked her up and took her to the orphanage. They, they later found an orphanage that handled older children. And little Stephanie was now in another orphanage where she had a place to sleep and she got regular meals. One day, a tall American man and his wife came into the orphanage. They were there to adopt a little Korean boy, an infant. And they were going to name him Stephen. And little Stephanie, who helped take care by now, she's nine years old, who helped take care of the infants, saw this man pick up a little baby boy who had no parents, who was not claimed. No one was taking responsible for this little boy to love and care for him. And she saw the man pick up this little baby boy and she saw tears come down his face as he looked at this baby who needed a family, who needed parents. And then he put this one down and he picked up another one. And again, she saw tears coming down this man's face. Let my heart be broken by the things that break God's heart. She watched and, and little Stephanie was transfixed because she had not experienced or seen tenderness from a man. Her experience was men was somebody grabbing her and dropping her in a well or striking her or throwing rocks at her or cursing at her. She had not experienced tenderness and she was just gazed in awe. How many people that you know have not been loved who've not experienced tenderness who've not been able to trust that somebody was going to be there for them who have not felt the security of godly parents the man noticed her watching and he walked over to little Stephanie and he got down on one knee And he looked into her eyes and he slowly and gently reached out his hand and he cupped the side of her face and he looked into her eyes and there was such a tender, loving look in his eyes and she felt that that touch that was safe and appropriate and tender and in her mind she said please don't stop she was hungry for safe loving touch 
God wired us to be loved, to be touched appropriately. In my last church, I had some elderly people who came to church who were alone. And every Sabbath I would hug them. Because who in their life was there to touch them with love and appropriately? Church, we need to make sure there are good boundaries and everyone's safe, but church needs to be a place where God-given needs are met in a healthy way. Where love is given to those who need love. So little Stephanie, that strong, gentle hand on her face, please don't stop. But do you remember the name they called her? Garbage. And she felt feelings of unworthiness. And she felt that identity of what the life had called her. And she slapped his hand away and she spit on him. Have you ever slapped God's hand away as he reached out to love you? As he drew you to himself, have you ever spit on him, metaphorically? There are five basic fears that we experience as human beings. And it's not fear of the dark, it's not fear of heights, it's not fear of enclosed spaces. They're emotional fears. Rejection. That if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. Unworthiness. That something's wrong, that we don't deserve to be loved. Inadequacy is that I fear that I don't have what it takes. Abandonment is a fear that I will be rejected and left alone. And failure is a fear that if I try, I'll fail. Psychologists say that these fears that are life experience, the scar tissue of life leaves us with different ones of these fears that are more personal for us. I'm going to tell you what I'm afraid of. I fear rejection. I am afraid that if you really knew me, you would not love me. So put that kind of fear in a pastor where you can have members get mad at you sometimes or I've had members chew me out in front of the whole board. What buttons are being pushed inside my mind when that happens? Rejection. See, I knew it. I knew that if they, if they got to know me, they wouldn't love me. Another one is un, unworthiness. Somewhere in my life experience, the message was through the scar tissue of life, I received the message that I, that I don't deserve to be loved. And the irony is, I have been loved by so many people. Every church I've ever pastored, we always, I always cried and they always cried when I left. The problem is, even though you experience a lot of what you need, if that fear is not addressed and processed and understood, then all it takes is one person who doesn't like you, or for me, one person who for some reason doesn't like me or criticizes me, and then that those messages, see, you don't deserve to be loved. Is there anyone here besides me who struggles with a fear of rejection? Is there anyone here besides me who struggles with a fear of unworthiness? Is there anyone here who struggles with a fear of inadequacy? I don't have what it takes. Is there anyone here who struggles with a fear of abandonment that I'm going to be left alone? Is anyone here who struggles with a fear of failure? If I try something, I'm just going to fail because that's what I do. And these fears 
are wired into us by our life experiences, by the scar tissue, by the times we get hurt, by the times we needed comfort or love or encouragement and we didn't get it. By the names people called us when we were kids that hurt our heart. By the things that people made fun of us about. By the times people we should have trusted, been able to trust, hurt us or betrayed us. What fears was little Stephanie processing when she slapped that man's hand away and spit on him? What fears do you think she was processing? Unworthiness. Unworthiness. I don't deserve. I'm, I'm garbage. I don't deserve. Rejection. Rejection. Abandonment. Abandonment. Failure. Failure. So, I have to wonder, the times we slap God's hand away... Is it because we're afraid? Is it because we're afraid? I remember as a new Christian. I was raised in a conservative church. I was told when I was a kid that if you went inside a theater, your guardian angel waited outside. (laughs) Anyone else ever hear that when you were a kid? (laughs) Stupidest thing I've ever heard. (laughs) That's not what you believe. So in that atmosphere, I was really afraid of God rejecting me. And so as I became a Christian, does that automatically mean that temptation stops and you stop making mistakes? And so I would, oh, and I'd I'd go back to God and I would plead, forgive me, please forgive me. And please help me. By the way, asking God to help you is the wrong prayer. Because that means God is, is like Batman and Robin, your dynamic duo, and that you're doing it but just need a help. We can't do it. We need God to do it for us. So the right prayer is God, change me. God, heal me. God, save me. But I remember those feelings, those, that fear of God's rejection when I would make mistakes as a young Christian. And I would think to myself, I wonder, because there's that verse in the Bible that if you sin against the Holy Spirit, that sin cannot be forgiven, right? Amen. And there's the verse in Hebrews that says that if we keep sin deliberately after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And I read that verse and it scared me to death. Amen. And I remember failing and thinking, I'm lost. There's no hope. And then this thought came to my mind. I wonder how long I'll have to burn in the lake of fire. How much of your life do you spend reacting to those fears? How many things you do, your reactions to comments of people, your reactions at work, your reactions with your family are based on these fears. The next day, the missionary and his wife were back at the orphanage and little Stephanie was summoned to the orphanage office and she thought that she was going to be punished because of what she had done. But the orphanage director said, they're going to take you home. But she didn't understand that she just got adopted. She thought they needed a servant to work for them in their house. They needed a household servant. And she was fine with being a servant. Because at least she'd get to eat. So they took her home. There was so much lice in her hair. Their hair was almost white. And she needed lots of health care and dental care. And they loved and cared for her. They couldn't speak Korean. She could not speak English. And she thought she was there to work, to earn her place in the family. And these strange people didn't give her work to do. They just loved her. And one time she said to another person in Korean, I don't understand these people. They brought me here to be a servant, to work. And they don't give me any work to do. And the person said to her in Korean, Stephanie, they did not bring you here to work. 
You're their daughter. You've been adopted. And, and, And that just blew her mind and she went running to where her mother was, her adopted mother, and she burst into the room and in Korean she started saying, I'm your daughter. I'm your daughter. I'm your daughter. And her mother didn't understand what she meant. So she called for someone to translate. And when she heard that her little girl grasped that she was adopted, they both cried together and they embraced each other. They moved back to the United States and Stephanie went to high school in Indiana. Do you think there was scar tissue and emotional issues she had to work through? There were times, she says, that her parents would just, she would be weeping on her bed as a teenager and her parents would be just standing there. She didn't want them to touch her, so she would, they would just stand there. We love you, Stephanie, praying over her. And now she lives in Portland, Oregon. Her name is Stephanie Fast. And she wrote a book called She's Mine. And that old woman who said, you must stay alive. It's because Stephanie goes around the world. She's a social worker. She goes around the world and works with orphans who've been abandoned. And she tells them her story. And she shares the hope of Jesus with them. You can look her up on YouTube, Stephanie Fast. And she's a hero of mine. In fact, I met somebody who's heard her speak and I got excited because the the story just just really uh, touches me. John 1.12 To as many as received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What does God want of you? In this verse, what does he ask of you to become his child? To receive, when I proposed to my wife, I was really nervous. I was shaking. She said, are you sick? (laughs) And I asked the question and she didn't say yes. She just started crying. (laughs) So I was more scared. And then she said, I'm going to be your wife. (laughs) Praise the Lord. But she said, yeah, yeah. she eventually said yes. (laughs) She received relationship. That's what God wants from you. To receive relationship. Morris Vinden taught us. Christianity is not about what you do. It's about who you know. But who you know will change what you do. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus. And believed in him. Believe his promises. That the cross is big enough for your life and your sins. And when we receive Jesus, the Bible says that our sins are cast in the depths of the sea. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's in Jesus. When Jesus came, he brought his father's checkbook. He had all the resources and authority of heaven. Remember scripture said, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. So if the son sets you free, you're free indeed. And if Jesus loves you and accepts you, heaven does too. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. When Satan comes to tell you you're a great sinner, go to the cross. When that addiction is holding on and you don't know what to do and you don't think you could ever get free, go to the cross. Making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies where? Not in God's side of the street. In our minds. Because of your evil behavior. Because we know we've sinned. It's like I kept making mistakes and sinning. Sometimes even rebelling against God. 
And the enemy would tell me, I see, there's no hope for you. This may work for more spiritual people. It doesn't work for you. And somebody told me something that changed my life. They said, keep coming to Christ. Because the Bible says, those who come to him, he will never cast out. Keep coming to Christ. He will never cast you out. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now... He has reconciled you by God's physical, by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. It's the cross of Jesus. It's the cross that provides the way for us to be reconciled with God. And if we know Jesus, it changes what we do. Why? Because we love him. I believe that this whole issue of the fears is a really big deal. And I believe that if we think that when we become a Christian, we've got to earn our place in God's family by being good. I think it sets up a situation where, number one, we don't serve God from our hearts. And number two, where we don't love each other. Because if I'm not sure if God accepts me, then the only way I can feel good about myself is comparing myself to you and seeing if I'm doing okay and if I'm doing better than you are. Huh? I've lived in an Adventist community at Andrews and I would be at the grocery store and someone else would come up and guess what they would do when they saw my cart? They would look in my cart to see how healthy I'm eating. Right? Because we compare ourselves with each other. Because we think we've got to earn our place in God's family instead of accepting the idea that we've been adopted. Because when a child is adopted, what resources do they bring to the family? No resources, but how many needs do they bring? In my hand, no price I bring. Only to thy cross I cling. We have nothing to offer God spiritually. Except for our need for his mercy. And he wants our hearts. This, This text really hits me. In John chapter 10, beginning with verse 11, Jesus is talking about this. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hired servant... He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Do you see the difference? The difference between a shepherd and a hired servant. If I do not believe and grasp the fact that I have been adopted by God, and I have a transactional relationship with God where I have to earn His grace and His love, then I will be a hired servant and I will not serve from the heart. And when I get called by the nominating committee, I will be, well, not this year. I'm going to take the year off. Or do I have to? Or I'll I'll help with the children's department one Sabbath a month. Are you okay with me being honest? Yes. Amen. If we do not grasp the fact we've been adopted, we will not serve God from the heart. We will serve God. To earn love. And how does that work? The hired servant flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. If we are hired servants, we're not going to love our fellow Christians. We're not going to really love them from the heart. We'll do it to look good. But we're more concerned about our image than we are about loving people from the heart. I have a a friend whose son got into drugs and stuff like that. And the friend said to his son, You're making me look bad. The concern wasn't really for his son. It was for himself and how he looked. 
And that's what hired servants do. But if we are adopted, then our hearts are set free to really love our brothers. And it's not about us. It's about Jesus and them getting together. Isaiah 43, 1, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. In the same way that God told that Swedish nurse, she's mine. He looks at you and says, she's mine. He's mine. He claims you. You're claimed when you allow him to adopt you. And when you really believe what he said, that the cross is big enough for you. And that the Holy Spirit, when you seek the Holy Spirit to live inside you. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are struggling, friends. We are struggling. Pornography is devastating men in our culture. It's, It's devastating. And this verse says that it's only grace that can teach us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. It's only grace. And if we think we've got to, we have to earn our place in God's family, we don't grasp grace and we will not be able to say no. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. It's about what Jesus does. You will never get your act together. Ever. But what you can do is have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. And believe in his cross. And the reality and the power of that cross can redeem us from wickedness. And purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see the difference? Living from fear or eager to do what is good because the love of Jesus has gotten into our hearts. Faith and works, page 18. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt on more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or placed more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone that's why adoption is such a powerful metaphor an adopted child brings no resources they come with their need and what does an adopted parent want from their child my parents adopted my brother all an adopted parent wants from their child is to let them love them right and to love them back that's what they want and that's what God wants from us too Desire of Ages, page 35. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. If I think I've got to earn my place in God's family, I will have no barrier against sin. I have a friend who was very, very judgmental and difficult on other people. Very strict, very um, legalistic, criticized other people a lot, very works orientated, very judgmental, very holier than thou, but deeply respected by many people. 20 years later, we found out there were three other women besides his wife that he was sleeping with. I don't think he was insincere. I think the problem was he had a form of religion that did not allow Jesus to get to his heart. 
He thought he had to earn his place in the kingdom instead of realizing he was adopted and loving God and letting God love him. He was trying to earn God's love. And when we do that, we have no barrier against sin. I grew up in Alaska. And when we got married and I became a pastor, I needed to buy a new suit. And my wife said, Bill, let's go to Nordstrom's. They're having the half yearly sale. And I said, I don't want to go to Nordstrom's. Their clothing is too expensive. And this Alaskan boy didn't want to spend that kind of money. Have any of you men heard this kind of tone of voice from your wives? Now, Bill. (laughs) If you buy something quality and take care of it, it'll last a long time. So we went to Nordstrom's at the half yearly sale, and I bought the suit. I wore it for 20 years. The buttons are still on. The seams are still good. A little tighter than it used to be. (laughs) And it's a lighter um, wool. And so I do, um, I've done a lot of weddings because I was at the academy uh, for so long. So I've probably done 30 weddings wearing this suit. And I probably preached in it probably 100 times. We did the math, and this suit costed me $15 a year to own. So, one day, I started noticing that right here on the seam, by your pocket, the the pants of this suit started to, the the seam started separating. And I said to my wife, well, that's too bad, I I, kind of like the suit. And then I said, I'm going to take it back to Nordstrom's and see if they'll sew it up. And she said, don't, Bill, don't do that. You wore that for 20 years. It's old. Don't do that. But I'm the Alaskan boy, right? So I take it back to Nordstrom's and I show them the trousers and they said, oh, we can fix that. No problem. They write out a paper for me. They give it to me. We'll call you when it's done. Well, I got a call several weeks later, Mr. Roberts, would you like to come pick up your pants? They're done. But what had happened is, uh, I'm just a big supporter of Christian education. I'm the ministerial director, and Auburn Academy didn't have a senior Bible teacher. And the conference president, John Friedman, asked me, will you teach senior Bible and still be ministerial director? And I said, yep, love the kids. So I I was really busy. And I forgot to go get my suit for six months. So finally I get this this call from Nordstrom's. Mr. Roberts, would you like to come get your pants? And I was kind of embarrassed. So I the first chance I had, I drove to South Center to the Nordstrom's. I went in the store, gave him my piece of paper. He said, oh yeah, we'll be right back. And he went in the back and he was gone a long time. (laughs) And he came out and he had kind of a worried look on his face. He said, we can't find your pants. Give me another minute. He went back. He was gone a long time. And I'm wandering the store looking at things. Finally he comes out and said, we've lost your pants. We're going to give you a new suit. And I said, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I said, I bought the suit 20 years ago. I've worn it for 20 years. Um, I didn't come get the pants for six months. You don't owe me a new suit. We're Nordstrom's. We're going to give you a new suit. What kind of suit do you want? I said, well, um, we argued a bit more. Remember what my fear is? Unworthiness. Right? And finally, he said, Mr. Roberts, what kind of suit do you want? I said, well, it was gray. And it was a little bit lighter wool. And he said, like this one? And he pulled this suit off the rack. And he grabbed another one. He said, let's go try it on. So we walked back into the little changing room and I go back in the room and 
I'm trying it on, and I've got it all on, and then I thought, I wonder how much the suit costs. You know how they put the price tag right in here? So I go like this. <gasps> it was $800. <laughs> And so I'm thinking, wow, uh, this Alaskan guy would never spend, eight, could never spend $800 on a suit. So um, we go out and I start arguing with him again. And he does not pay any attention to me. He brings the tailor and they're measuring the length of the pants and measuring the arms. And, and, um, and I'm feeling a lot of grace. Because I know I don't deserve a brand new suit. And I'm trying to think how I can say thank you to Nordstrom's. And so I thought to myself, I'll buy a tie. <laughs> and that will be me saying thank you to Nordstrom's. So I said to the salesman, would you help me pick out a tie for this suit? He said, I've got just the one. I've been looking at this one for days. Come right over here. And he pulled this suit, this tie, off the, the table. And he held it up with a suit. And he said, what do you think? I said, that's great. I'll buy it. So we go over to the, to the um, cash register. And you know how they always have the price tag right here. <laughs> so while he's hitting buttons, I'm going like this. <gasps> Ooh. It was a hundred bucks. And again, I, I've never bought a tie for a hundred dollars. <laughs> and I didn't complain at all how much the tie cost. Did the tie earn me the suit? Did the tie pay for the suit? Whatever you do for Jesus doesn't pay for anything. All the tie is, is me saying thank you. And whatever you do for Jesus is you saying thank you. And you're being like an adopted child who helps the family because they're part of the family. Not trying to earn their way into the family. And so, every time I tie this tie, it reminds me of grace. And I've told this story all over the place. And so many people have told me, that's the best advertising Nordstrom's could have had. <laughs> One man walked out, and, and he's a very successful businessman. He told me, I, need, I want to go shopping at Nordstrom's, he said. <laughs> so what are you doing to say thank you? Because let me tell you this. The tithe you return, the offering you give... The teaching children Sabbath schools, the setting up and taking down chairs, running PA, praise song, whatever you're doing is just saying thank you. But if we don't serve from the heart, it tells us something. We haven't grasped grace. Because if, if grace is not amazing, then why be thankful? And if you're not serving God very much, guess what? It means you have not really grasped grace. Because when you really grasp grace, you will be amazed and you will be filled with praise and thankfulness. Yes. And you will want to say thank you. Yes. A month later, I got a phone call from Nordstrom's. <laughs> Mr. Roberts, would you like to come get your pants? <laughs> I don't know where they were, <laughs> but I think God did this to teach me a lesson about grace. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he came to seek and save the lost. Thank you that on the cross he cried out, it is finished. It was paid in full. And we can be adopted because his cross reconciles us as we accept and receive him. And as we believe what he says about who he is and who we are. Lord, if there's anyone here who has 
who does not believe and has not accepted that they've been adopted and who thinks they're trying to earn God's way in the kingdom, set them free. Set their hearts free to praise you and live a life of praise. I thank you, Lord, for all the ways this church family, that they say thank you to you with their worship, with their praise, with their stewardship, with everything else. Change our hearts to make us loving and and to accept other people and to look at other people through your eyes. And today, if you are a woman, I want you to, in your heart, say to Jesus three times what little Stephanie said, I'm your daughter. I'm your daughter. If you are a man, if you're a male, say to Jesus three times what Stephanie said, I'm your son. I'm your son. I'm your son. I'm your son. And I'm really thankful. May my life praise you. May the service I lay at your feet say thank you. Amen. Amen.